All right, so let's play that music right now. UK tells in reference to melanated people or what you want to call them. In folks, black people, Negroes, autochthonous people, indigenous people, native people, original people, whatever it is, we're referring to them, the Negroes, that is. So let's get into it and I can expound on what I mean in the form of lore or storytelling in a certain area of the UK. So let's proceed and I'll break it down. So now this is the portion where we go into the foundational heavy information. I'm not going to spend too much time on this portion, but we're going to go into and take a look at uh, David McRitchie's book, Ancient and Modern Britons, Volume 1. Now, I will get straight to the point, and when that point is made, I'm going to move forward. I'm not going to do as much reading. Now, I will leave the page up long enough for you guys to pause it and read it. I'm not going to move on in a split second like that, but I will probably leave it up for like a second or two so you can pause it and resume reading and then move forward with the rest of the video all right so now let's look at chapter nine right here and it says okay so it has been seen that the topography of the country and many other world witnesses of their speech the english language all testify to the presence of a black race not yet blended with the white race and other evidences of history of legend and of custom have been adduced or cited as evidence now look the popular tales of the west highlands are full of dark-skinned people whose deeds are often recited by people half unconscious of the fact that they too are anything but white people in the tale of the shifty lad there is the gadash dove of Akoloing, who is perhaps identical with the black robber and Gadash Dub of the Varus fisherman story. Two tawny women figure in the tale of the soldier, and the widow's son is variously described as a slender dark lad, a black lad, and a black rough skinned lad. While Yang's the soldier's son encounters a black fisherman or fisherman who lives in an island cave the song of the yellow mulity arc mentions the three sons of the dusky black king Dwing, and also introduces kiar dub dusky black prince of laman and the grogak who figures in the lay of the great fool is of brown complexion the king of uh was that eos benane <laughs> yeah i butchered it forgive me who is of who is a prominent figure in the story of carnal goldban is a slender black man in one version and in another lean boned savage and swarthy the black warrior or dub that is black more moro Moray or more has already been spoken of and Mr. Campbell further states in remarking upon British traditions that a great black giant with a club appears in many Gaelic and Britain tales and in the same chapter he also speaks of the was it the Hien Dub Na Louis Biag or black girl of the clouds as well as of certain bald swarthy youths in addition to these there is in the tale translated the sharp gray sheep a black skinned girl introduced the hero of the lay of Oscar brown Oscar of the Alba and a big black girl who figures in the anecdote suggested by the song of the smithy complete my tale of west highland specimens so we skim pages 151 and 152 going all the way to the bottom of page 153 so now here's the bottom paragraphs of page 153 and it reads all right thus the legends and the history of the scottish highlands are both 
witnesses to the existence of purely black people. The Welsh traditions bear a similar testimony. The hero, Peridor, son of Evrock, <laughs> discovers a company of bald, swarthy youths sitting at the hall door of a black giant playing at chess. This giant is sty styled the black oppressor and seems to have been of the same genial nature as the black knight of Ashton under Lynn. He very frankly informs Peridor that for this reason I am called the black oppressor, that there is not a single man around me whom I have not oppressed and justice have I done unto none. Okay, so let's skip down to the part where it says at another time. Okay, so it says at another time when he and other round table knights were in Arthur's hall at Carleon, they saw a black curly headed maiden enter. Her aspect is characterized as rough and hideous. Blacker were her face and two, her two hands than the blackest iron covered with pitch. And her heel was not more frightful than her form. High cheeks had she and her face lengthened downward and a short nose and distended nostrils. And her teeth were long and yellow and her back was in the shape of a crook. And her figure was very thin and spare except her feet which were of huge size. In short, she had the race marks of the Negritos and Australoids of Professor Huxley and in a more pronounced and hideous degree than may be seen in any living representative of these types. So basically, in this story right here, they exaggerated her features. You know, just a, I mean, you can't have a story and it be legit as it is outside of the story. You have to add more and that's what they did with this lady right here. Hence the part where it says um, in a more pronounced and hideous degree than may be seen in any living representative of these types, the Negrito and Australoid people. And we definitely know how the Negrito and Australoid people look. I have multiple videos on these people right here. They still exist and you know they were in existence back then. So the last paragraph reads, Kainan, the son of Clyde No, encountered another of those black people, a black giant with an iron club, and such giants swarm throughout the Welsh tales. The Mabin Nogion <laughs> are full of black men, usually giants, always terrible to encounter, and they are all extremely ugly, in which respect they resemble the misshapen and swarthy Huns, the foul mouth and ugly black Dane who went to Vinland in the 11th century, the ill favored Moors and Saracens of Herald Lee, the hideous Egyptians who rode into Bologna in the year 1422, the deformed and shocking Samoyeds of the last century, and the blubber-lipped Kewak, whom the Armayad killed the black, crisp-haired wench that came to Caleon upon Usk was assuredly hideous, and the other giants are invariably ugly. Okay, now with this right here, I mean, this is from the perspective, I guess, of these, uh, I, I, I want to say white folks that migrated into the area where they had to encounter all these people right here, you know, all the natives, indigenous people, and then these, um, the Huns, the Danes, the Egyptians, the uh, Saracens, which is um, the Arabs and everything, and then what is it yeah the saracens and moors of heraldy right there so i mean so it's time to move forward right now all right so now we're going to go over the bottom portion of page 155 156 all the way to i guess the top of the page of 157 right there now this is kind of important it kind of goes into like i guess the lore and mythical parts of it but you know like when you 
come up with the tales and everything of that nature you fantasize i guess people who were actually real so like centuries down the line that story is uh based off of real people but the population centuries down the line they would see some mythical creatures and everything but you know how can i explain it well i can't really explain it so i'm gonna just read some portions of it okay i'm starting off with page 155 down here and it reads although certain divisions of this primitive black race are now only known in wells and elsewhere as quasi supernatural beings yet the blurred pictures that still remain to us are painted the proper color in welsh tradition says mr sykes the wabak is usually brown and the coblin now are black or copper color in face as well as dress okay so this word right here the grogak it translates to hag or witch and okay so now the word avagdu is the welsh and phonetical spelling of what in the scottish highlands is avagdub there's a word dub and the english of Abak Dub is the Black Dwarf. So that the name given to the male Grawaks is only another term for the Svertlings or Swarthy Dwarfs who are stated in Laxdale Saga to have slain Frodi the Gallant, the Grand Sire of Olaf the White and what is more this term connects the Svertlings with the Inglings Inglings or Marsh Dwarfs for although Abak is one of the Gaelic words for a dwarf it radically means a water man being made up of the now obsolete Ab water and Ak a termination as in Kuak, hair, man, signifying a person. Therefore, a Bagdub or a Bagdu, when analyzed, is seen to be literally black water dwarf, and consequently, the name generally given to the females of this race by the modern peasantry of Wales is quite appropriative or appropriate for the grow. Ragged. I don't know what that is, but on when are simply water hags or witches. Further, all these names remind one that the earliest forms of the words Marus, Moor, etc., and Kors, Kars, Kiar, etc., formerly touched upon, are closely associated with the sea and marshlands as well as with the swarthy tribes they designate bingo that's what it is right there all right we're going to continue the welsh tribes it has been said are full of black giants against whom the arthurian warriors fought and inference from this is that arthur's followers were white because the blackness of their face would not have been particularized had they been of the same hue themselves now, the author of history is said to have been himself of swarthy Silurian blood, but the author of romance has never been wholly identified with him, and indeed he is altogether difficult to localize in time and place. The legendary knights of the round table may fairly be assumed to have been of the civilized, Christianized, and Xanthro. Croic stock of provincial Britons who, if represented by the barbarian prisoner of the sculpture, were in face and figure strikingly handsome, and their enemies, who are usually styled the heathen, are seen in the Welsh traditions to be black. 
that is they were black heathen like Danes or like the Moors for the black people as we know and to date the Danish branch of that stock by many centuries how many no one can tell so really all of this mythology and lore the origin of it really comes from fairly humble beginnings because like for example these marsh dwarfs or um what they want to call them yinglings or inglings these right here the humble beginning aspect of it these people were water men or water women or whatever now just like when it says um abak dub or abak du that literally means black water dwarf but we see on page 156 right there that you know um that's a, that's a gaelic term right here in it it say it radically means water man but it's made up of the now obsolete ab or abh which is water and ak and it says that it's a termination as in that C I U T H that's pronounced like K E W right there. So it's Kuak. So that's like a warrior or something back in the day in that area. So then the water man, okay, what, what does that mean right there? Okay, now when you drop down on page 156 right there. All those names right there that you see, like Marus, Moor, Kors, Kars, Kiar. Okay, it says that formerly touched upon are closely associated with the sea and marshlands. Now that's where all these tribes of people, these swarthy tribes, that's where they, you know, lived and habitated right there. So, hence the water man or water um marsh dwarf or water dwarf or something because keep in mind these people had short stature so they were um swarthy which is you know melanated right there and they lived by sea and the marshlands so what else do we have um okay so that's about it for commentary from the bottom portion of page 155 156 the entire portion at the top of page 157 right there oh yeah yeah before i um, move on the top of page 157 okay so okay so these people were notorious or vilified okay and it says um, they were enemies to you know certain people they were looked at as heathens now who were the heathen people they were they weren't christians that's for sure right there so it says that um okay so the black heathens they were like the danes or the moors because you know the danes they had their own religion and the moors they had their own separate religion also that was not christianized all right so page 158 you can clearly see that it's talking about the i guess the attitudes or mutual enmity as they put it between you know, the black race and then the white race you know living side by side or you know in the same country right there so there's a lot of uh mythology and stories uk stories that really speaks of like just different black people you know the welsh black oppressor um the black moral of galloway and then um they talk about black oppression <laughs> you know because you had you had the danes right there you had um the first group of moors not not the muslim moors that uh conquered southern europe but you know, these were different people that was, I guess, uh, more connected with the Latin. 
because I mean Marvels that's lag Latin right there so uh, it must have been a um, I guess a derivative of that first group you know that's just me talking I'm not for sure I will definitely uh, follow up on that and uh, I guess be more precise in a I guess future video regarding that part but anyway you see on page 158 right there they talk about um, I guess peasant girls getting <laughs> I guess living life in fear because these Danes black heathens dub Ganty, black Danes like heathens they were ruthless people and they weren't the only melanated tribe that just oppressed these uh farmers you remember these these people that's coming in these paler people these you know whiter whiter people they are farmers coming from uh central europe the russian steppe i mean not central europe but central asia in the russian steppe region so you know, they were tilling the land, farming and everything. And the, the original people in that area, the indigenous people, I mean, you think they follow those rules that these, uh, I guess, immigrants <laughs> brought over? Nah, they did their own thing, man, because they know they were connected to the land. So, you know, it was probably friction, no doubt. So they, <laughs> you know, we haven't even spoken of... Uh, the black tribute you know <laughs> the, the uh, indigenous melanated people they were forcing or oppressing these newcomers to pay tribute to them so I mean that's why that's where you get this black oppressor stories and um, mythology from because I mean they really were antagonistic you know amongst each other but then like when you scroll down on page 158 right there, you see that it said, um, this state of things could not last forever. No two races, however antagonistic, could inhabit the same territory for countless generations without amalgamating. So we're going to speak on that part. And then that takes us to the next um, subject. Subject of G-O-R-M. Gorum. And let's see what that means right there because this right here, this last paragraph, that's a key piece of information. Heavy foreshadowing right there. But, you know, that's a key piece of information right there. Yeah, I really don't want to go over page 161 because it's just a reinforcing of what I've already said. You know, um, I mean, this guy, he said, that um the highland and welsh the irish tells i mean there's numerous evidences that blacks were not always enemies but i mean that's the point they were they were heavy in those um tales right there from scotland wales ireland who even um britain but then it gives the example of this penny chap right there and then um what is it Penny Chap book and the comical history of Simple John and his 12 misfortunes. And then it says that, okay, so how is he introduced? Okay, he's introduced as the Black Butcher on Tiot side. Okay, and he's a Black Amor right there. Okay, we'll look at that later. We'll go in depth later in future videos or presentations but yeah let's go into the gorum subject so this right here is a Quora article entitled why were black people referred to as Doreen gorm blue people in irish gaelic and how slash where did it originate we're just gonna look at well do mostly skimming of this article i'll read some i'll drop down a lot I'm not about to spend too much time on this article. Well, let's check out this part right here where it says the answer. Okay. The answer as to why the Gaelic of Ireland and Scotland refers to black people as blue people. Noin Gorma 
well the final a because it describes a plural noun is quite complicated taking into account as it does a mixture of history culture and a perception of the natural world so now the next portion down below is basically their lexical arrangement and how they understood things now the example being used will be white grapes now just check it out right here as i read a little bit of this portion where it says in this connection okay now it says um in this connection and before we go any further in examining why gaelic refers to those whom we call black people in english as blue people it is worthwhile to note that all languages including english have their own idiosyncrasies when it comes to the use of color how we label things for example in english those light colored grapes that we find in the supermarket we call them white grapes even though if we look at them objectively they are certainly not white in a way that snow or a blank sheet of paper is in fact objectively speaking they are light green not white however and no matter how green these grapes might be in reality we don't usually call light colored grapes in english green grapes we call them white grapes okay so okay so that's the convention that we have in english the arrangement that we have in english that's the label that we apply in this instance green grapes are called white grapes okay so that's enough of that part right there so the last paragraph before just above that um picture of grapes right there so what is this saying we're gonna skim this paragraph right here okay so just as english speakers refer to green grapes as white grapes the gaelic speakers refer to black people as blue people this is the convention or arrangement that exists in gaelic so on one level the fact that gaelic speakers call black people blue people is no weirder than the fact that english speakers call green grapes white grapes it's a matter of convention or the arrangement and those are two conventions in terms of use of colors that exist in gaelic and english respectively okay so however amongst the european languages gaelic is unique insofar as it uses a word that normally means blue gorm or gorum to refer to people who are referred to in other european languages by a word that normally means black noir french negro or negro spanish and portuguese nero and italian schwartz german zwart dutch keep that point in mind right there so this part these grapes are green but you call them white now we're gonna look at this third paragraph right here starting at first of all first of all i should mention that the word gorum which is most commonly translated into english as blue covers a different range in the spectrum than what english speakers would commonly understand by the word blue this is something that can be really difficult to explain well particularly to anyone who speaks only one language okay in a nutshell different languages divide up the spectrum of colors differently in this regard gaelic is no exception and indeed it divides up the spectrum quite differently from english indeed there isn't even uniformity in the division of the spectrum between the gaelic ireland and the gaelic of, of scotland both of which have the word gorum in their vocabulary but use it slightly different to describe a slightly different range in the spectrum of colors in scotland for example the word gorum is used to describe the lush green color of mature grass 
and foliage whereas I think the Irish Gaelic prefers to use the word glass here which refers however to a shade of greenish gray in Scotland in the Gaelic of Scotland however Gorham starts at a point in the spectrum that English speakers might call mid green before progressing through to the range of mid to dark blue shades as far as what English speakers might call midnight blue so for example when Scottish Gaelic speakers are praising the inner Hebridean islands of Islay in the famous old song there you go green Islay of the grass it is not that the Scottish Gaelic speakers are colorblind and cannot distinguish between green and blue it's just that the Gaelic of Scotland uses the same word Gorham to describe part of the spectrum that for an English speaker is divided up between mid green and blue Scottish Gaelic speakers don't think of the grass on the fair Isle of Islay as blue they think of it as green but there's a single word in the Gaelic of Scotland to cover that particular part of the spectrum Gorham both the Gaelic of Scotland and the Gaelic of Ireland do however use the word Gorham to describe the color of the people whom English calls black so you might be wondering how on earth Gaelic can apply the same word Gorham to the color of grass which English calls green to the color of the sea which English calls blue and to the color of people of African or Afro-Caribbean origin or just melanated people in general whom English calls black how did we get here okay so we're going into the example part and we're gonna drop down to where say first of all all right I'm gonna paraphrase a lot of this so bear with me please Okay, have you ever picked up from the ground a feather that's fallen from a passing crow? Have you ever got up close and personal with a black faced lamb, perhaps to bottle feed it because it's hungry and all right, let's go. Have you ever, have you, and this one's probably only for anyone who grew up in Scotland, Ireland, Canada, and spent time at agricultural shows ever patted a prize black bull and watched as the effect of your pats rippled across its flank in each of these cases what did you notice what did you see if you are observant you may have noticed in all three cases the feather of the crow the face of the black faced lamb the flank of the black bull a kind of iridescence a bluishness amid the black particularly in strong sunlight basically that is what Gaelic is picking up on when it refers to something that is black as Gorham blue and that is the fundamental reason why black people are called blue in Gaelic you see Gaelic describes as Gorham blue any dark surface that picks up the light that has a sheen or iridescence is almost as if Gaelic is looking past the darkness of the surface itself and concentrating more on the shine that comes from such surface. I don't know in which century Gaelic speakers first had contact <laughs> with people of they say melan I mean melanated, let's just say melanated. But they say um, African or Afro-Caribbean origin but this is the characteristic that they the Gales picked up on and henceforth used in the language to describe those people whom English calls black indeed some European artists in the medieval era seems also to have picked up on this sense of bluishness in the complexion of some quote black unquote people and have painted them accordingly with a bluish tinge to their complexion this is the case in particular with some old artistic depictions of the three wise men or magi 
visiting the Christ child, at least one of whom is traditionally depicted in European art as black. Okay. So now, as that picture clearly shows on the far right corner, the adoration of the Magi, you see this guy, he's, I guess they considered him Gorum in Gaelic right there. So that's blue right there. Now, let's bring another element to this right here. I'm going to start on the second paragraph right there. He say, so now that we've explained why Gaelic uses the word Gorum to describe the people whom English describes as quote unquote black. Let us move on to the third and final part of our story. Why Gaelic does not use in this particular situation its own word for black dub. Okay. So this guy, Ronald Black, which is a Mac Il dub or something. He wrote in Gaelic, some colors have a figurative meaning whilst or whilst other colors are dripping with metaphorical significance. Dub, the Gaelic word for black, definitely belongs to the latter category. That's what he claims, but let's see. Okay. All right, we got fear dub, literally means the black man or the black one, which capitalize, with capitalized spelling, is a traditional name in Gaelic for the devil <laughs> himself. In this way, Gales avoid mentioning him by name, which makes it possible to talk about him in conversation while at the same time reducing the risk of summoning him by accident because it <laughs> because it avoids the use of his actual name from the Bible. Okay, Dumhall Dub, literally Black Donald, is another traditional but more informal nickname in Gaelic for the devil, <laughs> perhaps roughly equivalent to the English term old nick for the devil in terms of familiarity and humor so contrary to the modern popular imagination in an english dominated world the devil in gaelic is not depicted in the color red even when he is depicted in the former or the form of demon okay instead he is associated with and depicted in the color black enough as in literal black like cold or ink and instead of depicting him as a demon he is often depicted in the gaelic folk tales as a handsome mysterious and taciturn stranger in human form dark in hair and complexion and black in clothes okay damal dub in this iteration has a fondness for inviting those present to join him in a round of drinks and game of cards on a Sunday, drinking and playing cards on the Christian Sabbath were considered sinful in many parts of the Scottish Highlands at well into the 20th century and are still avoided by some. In any event, if someone matching this description enters your Highland pub, all right, let's skip that part. Okay, so if a person described as a fear dub without capitalization then in Gaelic terms that means he is black in terms of hair color but not in terms of skin color Gaelic has a very long tradition of placing adjectives relating to color next to a person's name as an informal means of identifying that person okay distinguishing one person called Ian from another however was it Ian Dub Black Ian and Red Ian or Ian Wood means that the Ian in question has black hair or red hair not skin where Dub is used in Gaelic in reference to a person it refers to the color of a person's hair rather than to their skin so now below all of that right there we have the picture of the lamb with the black face kind of white too well not kind of he is white also so it says uh look at me carefully in gaelic my face is also blue now the below that's talking about like inanimate objects right there 
so the me- metaphorical side meanings okay okay it says many which carry negative connotations i'm not gonna go over this part right here but i will leave the link in the description to this article so according to this article this cora article here the claim that this person is making is that only gorum was used in reference to a person's skin color and that dub or duff only referred to a person's hair color not the skin color so like i say the argument is okay he's singling out gorum referring to negro or melanated people and then when you see accounts the numerous accounts of dub and rude or wood ruddy type for red that's just talking about the hair right there but we know better than that let's let's put that to the test so this is what comparative research is all about right here so let's look at something else before we really get down to the meat and potatoes so to speak or the serious stuff so this video gives an interesting um, explanation on what that term means and I will leave the link in the description. It's October, which means that it's officially Black History Month. Cheers to everyone who's celebrating and I hope you're celebrating at home wherever you are in the world. <laughs> but did you also know that even the name Gurm is tied to Black Irish history? On this Black History Month video, we want to share why we picked the word Gurm to represent us. So back in the day before we had the cranberries or even when Guinness was not in the picture of Ireland, the Irish language struggled with words referring to people who were not racialized as white. For example, you had words such as Fardolf, which was used to refer a man who had black features, such as black hair or black skin. But when you capitalize Fardolf, it means something really different and that is the devil. Unfortunately, this is consistent to how other languages in the past tended to equate dark skin with something dirty or even evil. However, of course, the Irish scrapped the word fire dove to refer to a person of colour and introduced the word dinna gurum. It's a bit odd because in the Irish language, dinna means person and gurum means blue, which combined literally means blue person. And yes, gurum means blue. However, comma, what I don't get is why blue skin? If I'm being the devil's advocate here, or Fire Dove's advocate, it makes sense for movies such as the Oscar-winning movie Moonlight, inspired by the play titled In Moonlight, Black Boys Look Blue. Where yes, some skin tones with cool undertones under certain conditions can look bluish. So I can see that for people maybe with deep complexions there, but Dinagurm can be quite artistic in those levels. However, for generations, the word dinagurm has been used to describe people who were not racialized as white or people of color in Ireland. So if you're not white, you're effectively blue. The other option left was dinajacha, which means colored person. So testing the second part of this article, that's the order for the day right here. So let's go ahead and deliver. Okay, so the tool that we will use to test that man's claim from the Cora article is the book Ancient and Modern Britons. You know, the claim was that, okay, Gorum was the only one used to denote the people and dub and duff and everything that was used to denote um, inanimate objects or hair color or eye color or whatever. You know, um, rude or ruddy also. So we're gonna test that and um, again, Ancient and Modern Britons, Volume 1 by David McRitchie. Okay, here we go. Page 311, starting at 4 Gaelic, reads, For Gaelic, however, it may have altered from time to time, owing to various causes, and whatever may have been its first shape, and at whatever date it may have been first spoken in the British Islands. Gaelic has been the language of the civilized element in the Scottish Highlands as civilization is now understood and it is not the language of those gypsies it is not the language native to highland tinkers and tinker fiddlers at the present day it is in gaelic that we hear of the vulgar tongue as black speech nor is it 
is the language of the Welsh minstrel of today, that variety of speech known as Welsh. On the contrary, it is black speech or gypsy. Neither did the earlier harpers and pipers of the sister island employ that language Gaelic, which was so preeminently the speech of Ireland. Whatever their tongue, it was not Gaelic. On the revival of literature in the 11th century, says Mr. Walker in his historical memoirs of the Irish bards, drop down. And the same writer quotes this from Stana Hurst's description of Ireland, compiled from several authors of this period. The tongue, tongue or language of these minstrels is sharp and sententious and offereth great occasion to quick apothems and proper allusions drop down to thus thus the common gestures and rhymers of early ireland whose business it was to bard and flatter certain gaelic speaking families these jungler jugglers possessed a language that not only one in five hundred of the gaelic people could read write or understand and I'm going to read that part too. These men were identical with the black skinned minstrel jugglers of the John of Rapane story. And with the bards and professed plaisance of the Scottish Highlands in their most striking characteristics. And in at least two of these instances, the language of such people was black speech. So we already realized that Gaelic wasn't a native UK language that would go to the quote unquote black speech. That was a real thing. And of course, they had their own language and you know, writing system. Pages 313 and 314, the highlighted portion reads, the others were old stained green men like the savages of the popular memory and of history is shown by the prevalence of the title Gorm after the names of islanders. This word, it has been noticed, is translated either blue or green, just as the Roman styled certain ancient Britons, Cairule and Berides, indifferently for the reason that the color of Wode or Gorman may be described by either adjective as an agnomen Gorm must have must at one time or another have become fossilized, perhaps at different dates in different families. It is usually translated blue or green in such connections without any attempt to explain the meaning of the appellation. The many agnomens that denote the colors black, brown, tawny, gray, red, yellow, white are usually rendered black and haired as formerly observed. And no doubt this translation is sometimes correct, but it is evident to any translator that blue and green could never relate to the hair. And so many, and so the many Donalds and Duncans bearing this title have been abruptly introduced to us as Blue Donald or Blue Duncan without any attempted explanation of so odd a nickname. When in one instance, I have seen it rendered blue eyed, but against this, there is the twofold objection that it might as well have been translated green eyed. And also that such a free exception of one color nickname would entitle one to render the others as black, red, or yellow eyed with as much reason as black, red, or yellow haired. The real solution of the difficulty seems undoubtedly to that to be that certainly in the case of Gorm and probably in a large number of other cases, no direct reference is made either to hair or to eyes. The date at which the Gorm lost its original significance and became a mere hereditary name as meaningless as the surnames white, black, and brown now are cannot be decided. As just suggested, 
it probably became fossilized at various dates in various races. Gorm the Old, the fierce old pagan Dane who died in the year 935 and who was ancestor of Sven and Gnud of England was likely suitably named being presumably Gorm the wold colored man just as his contemporary Dub Velniger of Scotland was the black man. All right, so just so folks know, an agnomen is almost basically a nickname that was used to differentiate people. And it kind of became like a quasi surname or a forename of some sort. Now, I really like, now one thing that I really, really love is how this book pointed out the inconsistent nature of attributing like the agnomens of black, brown, tawny, gray, red, yellow, and white to the hair. And then there's other agnomens like blue and green that doesn't line up with hair color. So then what they're gonna do, they're gonna flip it to say, all right, blue and green is in reference to the eye color. But I like what the book mentioned on page 313. It said, um, in one instance, he seen that it was rendered blue eyed, but against this, there is the twofold objection that it might as well have been translated green eyed, and also that such a free accept acceptation of one color nickname would entitle one to render the others as black, red, or yellow eyed, with as much reason as black red or yellow haired so he just mentions that there's difficulty and i guess probably uncertainty in what they really mean you know i guess the modern day folks today when it comes to that type of stuff the bottom portion of 314 and 315 reads the savage chief of the mcleans or mcleans had sent his wife to a cruel death as he thought on this title lady ladies rock and after they had carried out the barbarous orders these very men says mr campbell returned to duart castle where john gorm the first of the family of locknell a boy of three or four years of age was dwelling with his aunt the lady mclean whom they had left upon the naked rock and as soon as they had entered the castle of Duart, they kindled a great fire on the middle of the hall floor and formed themselves into a circle around the fire and caused strip the boy John Corm naked and placed him between them and the fire when the boy by reason of the heat was forced to run round the fire while each of them as he passed within the circle rubbed his naked skin with an hot roasted apple which occasioned blue spots on the boy's skin ever after for which he was called john gorm or blue john so let's drop down some as it stands the story is manifestly absurd the effect of repeated dabs with roasted apples could never result in this if ever the bizarre experiment was tried it is probable that the confusion has arisen in this way. The Gaelic ubal, an apple, is plainly a near relation of the adjective ubal, elliptical. Now, the tale in which this ubal figures is three or four centuries old. It relates to a time when a practice which existed in the time of Gross, the antiquary, and even yet must have been much more widely practiced. To make this these punctured figures iron engraved, there must have been an instrument briacier, as likely as not, it was elliptical in shape. It was Ubile. If so, it would as likely have been I mean, have an alternative name denoting its shape some noun very like ubal if not identical with it 
this is probable since Ubal pronounced Ubal. There we go. It's virtually oval or egg shaped from Latin ovum, Gaelic ub or ub and egg. So that uval, the noun, would thus originally indicate anything oval or approaching that figure, in fact, an oval. So my reason for sharing this account right here about the guy who's naked and having a high apple dab on his skin turning blue, like blue spots and what have you. That's just to show you the mythological nature surrounding this whole story that people are pretty much unfamiliar as to why people are called blue or Gorum or Green John or Blue John or whatever. I just had to read the, that account and then the explanation to that account to show how absurd that was to get you guys in a mindset okay what's the real reason behind this right here now here's the situation surrounding this entire thing right here when you have people in our day and age in present day when they try to decipher antique accounts or historical accounts there's more than likely some mistranslation that goes towards the confusion right here now as we see right here this whole thing that, that, that story of the apple that was a mistranslation because you can see that the Gaelic Ubal, you know, it was uh, I guess mistranslated. And okay, so hold on, Ubal is U B H A L, the um, the elliptical or the object that was really used to mark people is U B H A I L. So those are similar right there so more than likely that was a mistranslation right there okay so you see that ubal is pronounced uval which is oval or egg shaped from latin ovum so so i'm going to move on to the next point starting at the bottom portion of page 315 going into 316 right there and it reads but when the custom of tattooing became obsolete in the Hebrides and in consequence the tattooing instrument also. This meaning of the noun Ubal would also become obsolete. 316. The incident is also interesting in this way that it indicates that the Varides Karule or, or green men did not paint their skins with wool dye but pricked it in after pricked it in after the fashion of the existing Tartarin or gypsies of Egypt, the Dyaks of Borneo, and the official descendants of the Phrygians, our own sailors, who produced the blue color by means of gunpowder and of the Indian ink. If wool therefore was invariably applied in this way, Gorm would be included in the larger term Brack briac or break this blue john then was clearly not nicknamed after the color of his eyes or of his hair but of his skin okay, let's drop down the origin of the campbells has been much disputed and probably their pedigree is as mixed as that of most british people one of them was certainly a black colon of rome and the West Highland traditions speak of swarthy men from Lorne and the Black Knights of Loka or Lockaway. <laughs> but probably, as in every tribe and nation that has endured for many centuries, the ruling dynasty has changed over and over again. At that period, the Maclean's and the Campbell's seem to have been ranged on different sides. Although Blue John's aunt, his father's sister, had married the savage McLean chief. This, however, might have been racially an alliance of the Poquantai, or it's Pocahontas, but I, thought, I think it's Poquanta nature. Altogether, without fuller information, it is not easy to decide as to the side on which the green man preponderated 
nor is such knowledge needful at this juncture. With the information from page 316 in mind regarding the skin color not being painted but pricked or tattooed, we have to go back to that Quora article. All right, this guy he just isolated the word Gorum to just mean skin, but then duff and ruddy to mean like hair or other non skin color related things. You know, so that that far or it looks like fear, um, Gorum or or fear dub, far dub. That that was just one thing, but you know, don't be just so fixated on that. It's not set in stone. Just like this blue John or Gorum John, it's not just talking about I guess your natural melanated skin color, but it, you know, you gotta add in the element of being tattooed also. So um, when you look. Further down on page 316 right there, you can see that, I guess when they talk about the racial element, you know, um, you had, it was mixed, you know, it wasn't this or that, you know, it was, it was, you had white, black, and gray in between. So that's how you have to look at it. All right, so let's move forward. Bottom portion of page 316 going into 317 and it reads, Alexander Smith tells us a story of a McDonald of Slate, Donald Gorm, or Blue Donald as he was called, who is another example of this usage. Sir Walter Scott also in the history of Donald the Hammerer introduces a similar specimen in the person of the celebrated Kalen Wayne or Green Colin. This personal application of the adjective Juan or Wayne Green is seemingly very rare and it is also very instructive for it again brings to memory that the black man of Scottish Gaelic Dwayne Dub is the green man Dwayne Gorm of the Gaelic of Ireland. It does so in this way. The same word that is here translated green Wayne or Juan is in another place rendered dark colored. The spelling in this instance corresponds with that now in use in what we call with very little reason the English language. It is spelled W-A-N. It is a question rather in the days of Harry and Harry the minstrel. The dark colored sense of the word was expressed by the quickened intonation or whether he and his contemporaries still gave it the, the syllabic utterance that its green signification still possesses in the more archaic speech. But at any rate, this twin meaning of one corresponding as it does with the identity uh, between Dwayne Dub and Dwayne Gorm makes one long to learn more precisely the ex exact ethnological position of those southern tribes of whom this gorm custom was a characteristic at the time of Caesar's or caesar's landing this however is a side question hey we're never too old to learn things new hey me included so i know i was sounding very crazy saying duane and duane and all of that stuff but by viewing that gorum video of the Irish sister right there. I now know it's Dena, but this is an old clip. You know, I recorded these like uh, a couple months ago. So get to see my progression on this channel. Now, earlier we found out that Blue John wasn't really in reference to eye or hair color, but it was definitely a nickname that came about because of his skin right there, the skin color whether it's like naturally melanated or tatted up or both you know we have to put that in context right there now there's a relationship right there between blue and green and we found out that donald gorham gorham or blue donald and kaylin wayne or green colin it echoes back to you know dinner dub which is a black man in Scottish Gaelic and Dinna Gorum, which is the green man in Irish Gaelic right there. And then we see like the spelling um, U-A-N, which is pronounced the same as 
W A N Wan or that U A I N E Wayne Green. So with all of that in mind, we can proceed on page 318 right there. Pages 318, 319, and 320. I'm going to start on page 318 up top right here. And it reads, the precise date at which tattooing or painting ceased to be a Hebridean custom cannot easily be fixed. Okay, drop down. In none of these cases, Blue John, Blue Donald, and Green Colin is their direct evidence that the green man was a black man. And in the first example, the probability is quite the other way. For the rule of the black knights over that clan had probably by that time yielded to the supremacy of a quote unquote fairer, which means paler or lighter race. Either by the overthrow of a dynasty, as in the case of the Black Douglas nobles half a century earlier, or by repeated intermarrying of swarthy chiefs generation after generation with members of the fair-skinned races, Gales, Norsemen, Normans, and others. This revolution, gradual or sudden, must have taken place sometime or another perhaps before the time of john gorm perhaps after for the eminent chieftain of that race who has given the tradition to the public remarks elsewhere that his clansmen regard light yellow hair as one of the belongings of a campbell also the fact that tattooing that the tattooing of John Gorm was performed by his enemies and strongly resented by his friends apparently indicates that it was not a custom of his race while it undoubtedly was a black usage the conclusion which one naturally reaches after reading the foregoing evidence on this question fragmentary though it may be is therefore that the black breed and the blue squadron as gross puts it were identical and that the members of this squadron in whatever part of our islands they existed even so lately as gross's time represented the least civilized portion of our population as civilization is now understood that in fact the archaic term of green man is fitly rendered savage and although the straggling examples we have taken of Dua Caledonian green men do not distinctly say so, yet the presumption is that such blue Duncans and green Donalds are to be identified with the savages who molested peaceable churchgoers in the Hebrides some centuries ago and with the pirates robbers, creek men, soreners, and vagabonds generally who plundered travelers by land and sea and whose homes and lurking places were appropriately named when they received such titles as Aileen Dub on the northwestern and the Black Isle on the northeastern coast of Scotland. Bottom portion of page 319 reads, even so lately as the time of Gross, the Blue Squadron was composed of thieves and marauders, a notorious member of the Dick Turpin Brotherhood being handed down to posterity as Blueskin, and that even such recent Blueskins were in some degree or another of the black breed is likely for more reasons than one. Black is a very usual prefix to the names of highwaymen and robbers everywhere. Black Ralph in England, Black Peter in Holland, and many others. Not to stray, however, from Scotland, the author of Waverly has given us, whether by design or not, several instances of this. One of his most famous freebooters was Roderick Dub. Another of minor importance was Black Donaka in the heart of Midlothian and the very frequent occurrence of the descriptive epithet dub 
in the names of highland and island chiefs as well as the equally frequent occurrence of various names denoting varying degrees of blackness points most distinctly to the complexion of such leaders okay so now we had a footnote portion right here we're gonna read it you know we're gonna read the whole thing right here it says uh his appearance is thus described at the moment of lady staunton's encounter with him in this moment of terror and perplex perplexity a human face black and having grizzled hair hanging down over the forehead and cheeks and mixing with mustaches and a beard of the same color and as much matted and tangled looked down on them from a broken part of the rock above highlighted portion reads his adopted son who is erroneously figured as equally swart and begrimed is very appropriately described as wearing his hair twisted and matted like the glib of the ancient wild irish and like theirs forming a natural thick set stout enough to bear off the cut of a sword appropriately described because although f is effie's own child his upbringing was that of a young ku siutak or a black irishman <laughs> scott rightly makes this black donaka a gypsy and accepting him as a representative highland bandit and the lair of knock dunder as a representative excluding his oddities of the High highlanders who were not bandity we have the whole question in a nutshell this was some really good information we just need to arrange everything properly and put it in the correct order so that even a child can understand this right here actually before i do that let me go back to page 318 there's a footnote that i overlooked right there very important information so i gotta get it in here and all right so there it is in front of you and it's talking about francis gross right there and it says gross in his classical dictionary of the vulgar tongue gives the noun blue skin and it defines it characteristically thus a person begotten on a black woman by a white man one of the blue squadron anyone having a cross of the black breed now everyone knows that the skin of a mulatto is not blue there seems little doubt that this again points to the identity of gorham with dub or duff gross knew that gypsies of his day used to artificially discolor their faces and when he speaks of the blue squadron and the black breed he almost certainly has these in view i definitely have to show my source and that is legitimate now francis gross i mean he wrote a classical dictionary of the vulgar tongue in the year 1785 right there and just a quick rundown on it as you can see right there about the edition right here 182 pages it was published 1785 even have the publisher s hooper right there and um author francis gross now the book is definitely about what all right check out this abstract right there that's detailing i guess uh the contents that you'll find in it and i'm definitely gonna read this right here and it says um this chapter looks at francis gross's classical dictionary of the vulgar tongue again there's the year 1785 right there and it says a shrewd appeal to the concerns of his time gross appears to have compiled and edited his dictionary alphabetically suggesting that he made notes from his sources and later arranged them in the order they were to appear in his word list his etymologies display little knowledge of language other than english this good-humored antiquary and philologist as he was described in gentleman's magazine was certainly the most sensitive and perceptive recorder of contemporary slang and colloquial language of his age he dominated the whole character and trend 
of slang during the last three decades of the 18th century, as well as the first two decades of the 19th century. Okay, it's so like, um, I mean, what more do you need if you if you doubt if you doubt these sources right here? What more do you need? And for the trolls right there, do you know more than this guy? <laughs> I mean, hey, just be honest right there. Okay, so it's enough of that. Let's move on to the next point. So let's take a walk to the gray area. We're going to look at page 318 through 319 again. Now check this out right here. Neither black nor white. No pun intended, but gray area. And check out what it says right here. Okay. In none of these cases, Blue John, Blue Donald, and Green Colin is there direct evidence that the green man was a black man quote unquote and in the first example the probability is quite the other way okay so they're saying that okay instead of being you know uh, a swarthy black negro person they're probably a pale caucasian type person so look at this for the rule of the black knights in quotes of course over that clan had probably by that time, keyword right there, by that time, yielded to the supremacy of a fairer or paler race, either by, now pay attention, either by the overthrow of a dynasty, as in the case of the Black Douglas nobles half a century earlier, or by, here we go, take note, or by repeated intermarrying of swarthy that means dark skin right there. Swarthy chiefs, generation after generation, with members of the paler races, the paler divisions of the Gales, Norsemen, Normans, and others. Now it says this revolution, gradual or sudden, <clears throat> excuse me, must have taken place sometime or another perhaps before the time of John Gorham, perhaps after, for the eminent chieftain of that race who has given the tradition to the public remarks elsewhere that his clansmen regard light yellow hair as one of the belongings of a Campbell. Also, the fact that tattooing of John Gorham was performed by his enemies and strongly resented by his friends apparently indicates that it was not a custom of his race while it undoubtedly was a black usage so francis gross he knew about the blue squadron of the black breed in quotes he knew about the black breed in general so keep that in mind as we resume on page 319 right there and it says the conclusion which one naturally reaches after regarding the foregoing evidence on this question fragmentary though it may be is therefore that the black breed and the blue squadron as gross puts it were identical and that the members of the squadron in whatever part of our islands they existed even so lately as gross's time represented the least civilized portion of the population and what did they do green men that was an archaic term and it was kind of related to I guess what these other tribes, you know, the Gales and everybody else, that's what they saw as being savage right there. Now, it says that, um, okay, the examples they take in of the green man. Okay, so there's a presumption, presumption, presumption that Blue Duncans and Green Donalds are to be all right, same as savages who bothered, you know, peaceable churchgoers in the Hebrides centuries ago. Okay, so it says that they were what? They were pirates, robbers, creek men, sorners, vagabonds, and they plundered travelers by land, sea, and, and it was like, uh, and whose homes and lurking places were appropriately named when they received such titles as alien dub on the northwestern and the black isle on the northeastern coast of scotland right there so um what is it uh gorham 
and dub is very similar you know the irish they use gorum and the scots they use dub now keep in mind these were all the same people because i mean they didn't they didn't respect i guess whatever arbitrary boundaries between scotland and ireland there was you know these tribes you know just how we, we understand what um colonialism in africa did you know um you have say like the tuareg tribes and um they all over you know they cross borders just like we get that concept today you know back then these tribes of people they crossed borders you know they didn't just stop right here <laughs> you know and then some other people took over no they they crossed borders so that that dub that you see in scotland those are the same people that are referred to as gorham in ireland if that make any sense so now we are definitely coming to a close let me do a little summary before i end the presentation so david mcritchie he spoke of a black race not yet blended with the white and he spoke of other evidences of history of legend and of custom now the proof of dark-skinned people are numerous when you read the popular tales of the west highlands right there and we see that there are numerous dark-skinned people groups all over the british isles the salors the negritos the gypsies danes moors etc and these many tribes of melanated people were different people but these pale white people that came in they dealt with them and those uh dealings with them were passed down generation by generation and eventually they became stories of mythology so that's where we get that um popular tales of the west highlands right there so when it comes to gorum you know gorum can mean various things so when we're in reference to the people the complexion it is either a synonym for dub more key r one etc or it's bold colored dye on the skin which is a tattoo so gorum eventually lost the original significance that it had and became a meaningless hereditary name like that of brown black war or etc when it comes to surnames so that's all i have for this presentation i'm going to end it now and guys look out for the next video presentation to come down on this channel or platform later